well. It's great to be here. And uh, I think the last time I saw you was like in San Francisco two years ago. It's been a while. Yes, yes. Welcome. Uh, so we're going to talk about founders and product and is people more important than product? And uh, we've both been investing for a while. Um, we often hear VCs say it's always about the team, it's always about the team, and uh, you can take a kind of B idea, uh, but with an A team, it'll go further than an A idea with a B team. So what's your take on this? I, how about an A idea with an A team? Well, How's yeah, that? we all want that. No, I, um, <laughs> I, you know, for, I definitely over-index on people for sure. Um, in fact, to a certain degree, I almost don't care about the idea in the beginning, right? What I'm really focused on um, is trying to kind of understand kind of the psychology of a founder and like why they get obsessed with the particular space that they're going after. And like, I don't want to spend a bunch of time on the macroeconomics and understand the market size and all that kind of stuff, but like, what is the problem that they're really trying to solve and why they're so passionate about it? Because what I'm really trying to assess is what I think is, are who are people who are gonna be founders of movements? Right? If you think about every single uh, sector out there, there's always a few faces that emerge who are the people that represent that. It's built by a community, but it's always a handful of people who are the face of that movement. And that's what I'm really looking for. So taking that further, I mean, you've had a number of successes as, as an entrepreneur and investor. Um, let's take uh, one, of, one of your most recent big successes, Fitbit. You were an early investor. Uh, what was it? Uh, so you're telling me it wasn't the idea, it was the, it was well, the team the on that it's one? Comp you definitely have to, you have to square it up with the idea at some point in time, mm -hmm. right? But if you follow the smart founders and you really listen to why they get obsessed about a category or why they think it's possible, you'll become a believer, right? If they're really compelling. And that's the key. Like you have to really spend time and just dig deeper and deeper and deeper. I think what we saw with James Park um, was somebody, you know, this is circa 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. Nobody was investing in hardware, period. Um, we did MakerBot and uh, Fitbit um, in a very short time frame. And I think what James kept saying to us is like, you don't understand, there's, there's so much data we can capture in a very ambient way that informs people. And it's not just a gimmick, right? It actually mm -hmm. extends itself into healthcare, how you, you know, how you manage your body, right? How you think about your health how it becomes something that's front and center to you all the time. And he just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper into why that was going to make an impact on society and why his idea was a really great idea. Mm -hmm. And so over time, we became convinced. You know, we put, I think we put a million dollars in at a relatively modest valuation. And you're, uh, you're not going to tell us what that was? <laughs> well, we own 24, 25% of the company today, and it's a public company, um, valued at about $10 billion. So. You know, it was, it was a good deal. We did deal. well. It was a good, yeah, we did okay. Yeah. So, so how, um, and one of, one of the things that uh, founders um, are always surprised when I, you know, I won't write a check overnight. Um, I, I really like to get to know the founder and, and see them through different um, situations and circumstances. I mean, the um, kind of culture of the valley right now is, uh, or, I'd say about a year ago, was that financing seemed to be going on overnight. I mean, was that really happening? And how do you reconcile, you know, what you just, um, I mean, what you said with having to move quickly? Yeah, I, I, um, I think almost all the time, our best deals are deals that we do almost on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that doesn't mean that we had an hour meeting, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it might... Um, I, I think the intensity of our meetings can, and can be a little overwhelming to a lot of founders. Um, we'll pull people in real quickly. We build consensus. I think speed is absolutely mission critical. And I think the beauty of our model, we, you know, we manage about a billion dollars now. Um, we have four funds. Each fund's around roughly $250 million. But we're looking to cut checks in the 500000 to a million five kind of range. And when you look at the, um, the risk, from our perspective, if we get really excited about that founder, right, to write a million dollar check and to do it fairly quickly, 
it's not that big of a risk. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, we will yeah, act very quickly. Yeah, when you have a large fund, that, that, that's true. But then you also, uh, if you're investing early, uh, and from what I've seen of you guys, you, you are very active and, and working with the teams. Um, so how do you do that with such a large fund? Well, the other thing, too, is I think if you look at what we do at True, um, we like it weird. I mean, honestly, like yeah. we, if you like, if I, you look at my own portfolio, the things that I've done, you know. Well, you look at you. Well, right. <laughs> thank you. I'm pretty weird for sure. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Gonna get you I've for that you backstage. I've known you for a while. <laughs> I can do but, that. But um, you know, one one of the first investments I did was Danger, which was the first smartphone with Andy Rubin, mm -hmm. um, and that was an odd, you know, it was an odd concept, right? That you this phone would actually become a computer in your pocket. Um, Stonyfield Farms, you know, Blue Bottle Coffee, most recently. Um, uh, you know, MakerBot, Fitbit, these things, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're all a little offbeat and weird. So mm -hmm. I feel like, um, you know, when you start to get outside of the, you know, the kind of the hot spaces, mm -hmm. you have a little bit more time to actually, um, ref you know, yep. to make that deal, right? Yep. And, and you can be a little bit more aggressive. Um, because not everybody's looking at it. Yeah, and that's I, the key. I, that that is the key, and I, I did that with the blockchain sector uh, a year and a half ago, and it's it's working out really well. <laughs> and I, I think um, you, you guys are certainly a model of of uh, you know what early stage venture should should be about. It is looking far further in the future than a, I think a lot of investors are, are doing these days. Yeah. But I do want to come back. I think, you know, you, you eventually you have to square up on the idea. Yep. Right? So, and that's the key. So, like, let's take Blue Bottle Coffee because I think that's such a weird one. You know, when we did that investment, people were going, like, like what are you doing? You know, mm -hmm. like, that's it's so off, off target, whatnot. But when, you sat, when I sat down with James Freeman, who's the founder of Blue Bottle Coffee, it was no different than sitting down with James Park right, at Fitbit, or Bree Pettis at MakerBot, or Matt Mullenweg, who spoke to you earlier from Automatic, right? He was able to go in to a certain level of depth mm -hmm. and passion around why his product was different, mm -hmm. right? It's just coffee. Yep. On the surface, it's just coffee, but he started talking about sustainability, organic farming, um, certification for organic farmers in places where it's really expensive to do that. Mm -hmm. How could the company do that, right? Freshness of beans. Um, how you roast the beans, and then he went into the glassware, and this is where he had me. He's like starting to tell me like, you know, an espresso has to be in this little porcelain cup because it's married to the temperature and the consumption of it, right? And I'm like, what is he talking about? He goes, yeah, you can't get, a, you can't get an espresso drink to go at Blue Bottle. Yeah. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, that's just horrible. We're not going to deliver you happiness. And I'm like, well, okay, so why does this matter to the world? He's like, Everybody drinks coffee. It's one of the first things they do in the morning, right? Why shouldn't it be delicious? Why shouldn't it be thought out? Why shouldn't mm -hmm. we eliminate decision uh, making in the line? No small, medium, large. No flavorings. The anti-Starbucks. There you go, yeah. right? Simplicity, right? And yeah. it's, it's balancing that quirkiness and that obsession, that obsession with simplicity. And I think mm -hmm. when you find that founder who's doing that, mm -hmm. wow. Yep. That's one where you pay attention. You say, you know what? I'm gonna back up the truck and I'm gonna back that person because they see it yeah. and they're going to carry everybody with them. Yep. Yeah, and, and that, that's an excellent point where uh, it, it's, it, the founder needs to be able to attract people to his or her vision, right? And, and no one can do it alone. So that is also an important part of, of uh, finding the right founders um, and it's, it's that kind of glint in their eye, that passion that they show um, and you can always tell the difference between the kind of the people who are just being opportunistic versus the people who are truly passionate about what they're building. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay. So you showed me uh, a text uh, before we went on about um, <laughs> one that you did miss. <laughs> well, I missed a lot. Well, well, one specifically um, that um, I also think is is uh, just a fantastic company uh, that. Uh, that's being built right now, and that's Snapchat. Yeah. Um, so what was it that made you not take a look at it when you were shown the company, or did you meet with them and decided not to invest? Well, what I think, happened yeah, there? I think that, one is, um, that one's a hard one to live with because I didn't actually meet with the company, mm -hmm. right? So we didn't actually make time. So what she's referring, I was just laughing in the backstage about Nick Bilton 
who is a, a columnist at the New York Times and wrote about the text section. Last night at dinner, when we were all having dinner, uh, he wrote me, he said, so I wrote the first ever story about Snapchat um, and noticed that right after I'd written the story in May of 2012, I forwarded you a link to the article and made an introduction to Evan uh, and said, you should take a look at this company immediately. Guess what? You never replied. Lots of laughs. <laughs> Thanks for dinner. <laughs> they got that popped up. Yeah, it happens, right? I mean, you get, I mean I'm both a founder of About.B, and so I'm, I have an operating role, and I'm also part of the founding team at True Ventures and a partner and active in a lot of deals. So my life can get a little crazy, and sometimes I just don't, I don't um, follow up in the way that I should. Um, but the ones that are easier to live with are the ones where you've just made a call. You know, I missed on Pinterest. Um, uh, Did you meet with them? I met, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh -huh. You know, and I remember I came back and said, this is a special founder. Mm -hmm. I actually did say that in our partner meeting. I said, I think we should cut like a small little check, but, I, you know, uh, whatever. I just, you know, I didn't think that people would drag things up into their browser, you know, that little mm -hmm. thumb, that bookmarklet. Because um, you're not in third and then target my, And then market. the next thing I heard about it was from my sister who lives in the middle of nowhere. She's like, mm -hmm. have you heard of Pinterest? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, I <laughs> appreciate so, that. Sometimes you yeah. lose. I lost on Instagram. You know, right. Kevin worked for me um, at Sphere, my first company, and showed it to me. And we got caught up in we couldn't get a big enough um, piece of ownership. Mm -hmm. And so we passed, right? We're very ownership-centric. Um, I think one of the things that's really important for you if you're a founder out here um, is I always, um, I, I always tell you is, like, you don't spend enough time understanding what that investors' needs are across the table. And I think you need to spend as much time in analy analyzing that as you should be pitching, mm -hmm. right? You should really understand, like, what do they need so you have alignment. Um, and so sometimes yeah. you're going to miss. But we held our ground on Fitbit just to run the economics for you, mm -hmm. right? So we could have had maybe, maybe 10% of Instagram, and that would have been worth about $100 million. Mm -hmm. and. You know, we held here, and this is worth over $2 billion, right? So holding to that, mm -hmm. you know, and James had a lot of demand. Yeah. And that could have easily, we could have shaved off half of our investment there so if we not held. So at the early stage when yeah. you invested, Absolutely. there it was a competitive deal. So I think deal. if you look yeah. at the numbers, while we missed on one, yeah. we held our ground and we got lucky and we hit, there's an order of magnitude difference in yep. the return yep. in these equations. Yeah, just these slight settling. ownership percentage differences Huge. at the early stage uh, make a difference. Huge. I mean, with a smaller fund, I'm a lot less ownership um, driven, but if you run the numbers, it certainly makes a difference. Um, yeah, I'm lucky that you know yeah. two of our the, the two founding partners, John Callahan and Phil Black, are just maniacal about yep. that. Yeah. Right, like we really have to get to 15 to 20 percent ownership. Right. Otherwise, we're not in alignment with that founder. Yeah, yeah, and um, and and I have to echo what Tony just said. And and in, in terms of researching the investors, and and uh, I'm more likely to take uh, a call or look at something if the entrepreneur has targeted it towards me, and I and I view that as you know that's what they should be doing with their customers and their product, and and know why. I would be a good investor for them because not all investors are created equal. Investors invest in different things. I mean, you said you like weird things. They should know that they should go to you for weird things. Um, <laughs> yes, please. Uh, <laughs> bring, bring all your weirdness, people. I'm um, ready. We got that. One more question. We're almost out of time, but um, the Valley, I want to get there quickly because I'm based in New York. I've spent a lot of time in the Valley. Uh, what, what's your view on the future of the Valley? Well, you know, I used to have a, a bit of a contrarian view that I thought um, I, I thought you didn't need to be in the valley, and I still and I, I I've come full circle back to that that point of view. Um, but cause I, I tell you what's changed though. I went through a period where I thought no, you absolutely should be in the valley because it has inherent um, uh, you know advantages, right? Unfair advantages for you as a as a founder, mm -hmm. an entrepreneur. I think that now exists in so many different regions of the world, mm -hmm. but it's not as many as you might think. Right? Mm -hmm. In the U.S., I really put it in probably three regions, New York, uh, San Francisco, it, and possibly Seattle still. Um, but, you know, in China, obviously, is, is amazing. Yep, yep. That's and that's it. why we're all here. Um, hey, listen, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right. And thanks, Tony. Thank you, Jalak.